<clears throat> Hello, welcome, sound, audio, working, yes. Yeah. Very awake, very awake. Hello, everyone. Welcome, one. Welcome, all. Thank you so much for being here today on this lovely mid-April morning. So let's jump into it. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, overview time. We had our second exam on Tuesday, and I have not looked at them at all. So I have no idea what they look like. Um, we'll find out next week. Um, probably going to have to binge grade over the weekend. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's your update. Uh, hopefully by next Monday I'll have more answers for you. Um, second thing is uh, assignments. Assignments, assignments. Um, we have two assignments left this semester. Um, and... Basically, one of them is the one that's due on uh, Friday or Sunday. I forget what day I made it, but it's like due the end of this week, start of next. And that is our Python project, all right? So the Python project is to uh, take some rectangles and pack them all in a box. Um, so it's meant to be a level of detective work, but I'm going to just say it right now, if you're writing your own pin packing algorithm, you are fucking up. That's kind of the whole point. You're supposed to look into the void and see how much of a nightmare bin packing is and then run away and let somebody else's work do the work for you. That's allowed. Nothing in the rules that say you can't. External libraries are not off limits. So take that as the benefit you get for showing up to class, okay? Because um, we have a lot of assignments and I don't want people thinking they have to spend 20 hours building their own damn algorithm. Um, that's, like, the whole point is to not do that. The entire point of the assignment is to recognize how much work that would be, and then not. Literally, bin packing, a, like a novel approach to bin packing, got me a master's thesis. I don't expect you guys to do one in a week. OK? So that's the first thing. <clears throat> so that's project, uh, that's assignment seven. That's your Python project. Really, like, from an academic perspective, the classes that it asks you to implement for the project and some of the methods in those classes are a great example of even if you do use an external library to do the work, you need to stitch that library into your code. And that is a more valuable skill, in my opinion, to at least have interacted with because that's what most of industry actually is. You are not building the wheel from scratch. Part of academia is to validate that you can, in fact, do that because if you can do that, you understand how a wheel works and we're not going to put you out in an industry without knowing how wheels work. But realistically, when you're in industry, nobody has time to build their own wheels. So the real challenge and task that you often have to do is figure out how to take somebody else's wheel and smash it into your larger system without everything going kaboom. And so that's really meant to be the purpose of Assignment 7. Can you identify, detect, and then integrate um, a third-party library to do the work while still maintaining the expectations of the project spec. That's really the point that I'm trying to emphasize. Um, but I uh, just with how it's written and how the world is currently, um, that I feel I want to say that explicitly so I don't have half the class. Well, I still probably will because I don't think half the class watches any of this. So uh, at least half of y'all can just have that memo. And, and tell people that kind of the original concept I had back when I made this course pre-pandemic was that like a few people would figure that out and then the gossip would spread like wildfire. But we just have such a more dispersed existence these days. So that doesn't really happen. And I can't lean on that. So I have to be a tad bit more explicit, which I'm OK with. But like, that's why it's not written there. Uh, it used to work like that. I used to just be able to tell like three people. And before you know it, 100 people all knew. Doesn't, doesn't propagate like that anymore. Um, <clears throat> so there's your tip off, all right? Um, assignment seven is meant to be more doable. If you think it's on par with assignments four and six, that's not the intent, I promise. So that's assignment seven, and then the last thing we have is assignment eight, which is uh, kind of jank, so I just apologize. Assignment eight is two parts. The first part is a producer-consumer problem. It's a basic multi-threading problem. There are unit tests for them. We will cover multi-threading in Java next Monday, um, at least a very mild version. And the first half of assignment eight is meant to be very mild. It's, a it's relatively 
trivial producer consumer. So the challenge is figuring out how do I use threads in Java. Um, but once you've got those threads working, um, there's, there's not, it's not trying to give a bunch of curveballs and pitfalls. It is meant to be as straightforward as a multi-threading question can be, um, which is to say relatively. Um, but we will talk about multi-threading in Java on Monday, and I have a whole rant about why Java is actually good for that. The second thing uh, the Java assignment wants is uh, like a graphics program. So like, I'm sorry. Um, but basically, you're implementing a little racetrack, get a couple of car images to kind of traverse from right to left. Um, and it's going to be threaded. But the threading is primarily just so each car runs independently and because graphics require threading. Um, so there are uh, stuff in the project manual and I will add supplemental stuff uh, if I find it and um, it's, it's uh, appropriate. Um, but basically the idea is that we're gonna use Java FX. There are plenty of tutorials and guides online and you are kind of given open season on how you wanna implement this. It needs to use threads, but that's pretty much it. Um, I provide a video and basically I expect your code to behave like the video does. It doesn't have to stylistically match. You can make it cute if you want. You can, you can have fun with it. It's not meant to be uh, super strict on the styling. It's just meant to say, hey, you've got three race cars, visually render them and have them on a start button, move and race, right? And detect a winner. Um, so it's Java FX, and there is a lot of documentation for that online, and it is probably going to be one of those projects where you're just Googling, getting a bunch of answers from Stack Overflow, smashing them into your code until somehow, oh my god, it compiles and runs and I'm never looking at it again. That's really the kind of project it's going to be, which is like different than the common list, right? Common list, it is, you need to understand how common list kind of works at its core, or else it's going to just kind of eat at you more than you're going to get through it, um, just because that's the the nature of a language without much help and a very um, specific way of doing things. Whereas the Java FX is a very large, sprawling library with a lot of big features, and it is going to be a lot more of their support, there's documentation, you can just go find it and kind of use that as your kind of templates and guides to kind of get going. So <clears throat> we are kind of ending on a high programming note, but that is kind of the point, all right? This is programming languages, and it is meant to kind of allow you to demonstrate after this class that there's nothing that you can't deal with if it's thrown your way. Unfortunately, you already have that lesson from a few other courses, so apologies if it's just a repetitive bunch of work you have to do, but that's at least the intent there. Um, you know, if you can throw together something in C, Common List, Python, and Java, then you can handle literally anything someone throws at you, and that's kind of the point here. Um, again, the Java FX stuff um, <clears throat> just if you've got questions, let me know. Um, I know it's a, it's a tad much, but basically that's all we have left. All right, we have our final in those two assignments and that's all we have left for April. Um, so the last thing I'll say about Java FX and I'll shut up, uh, just use Java 8. Just use Java 8. Just use Java 8. All right, you can use more modern versions of Java, but then you need to like import Java FX and that's kind of like a nightmare. So like I'm gonna make that explicit. I might make an announcement, but just please, 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 just use Java 8. Java 8 has Java FX built in. You don't have to do DevOps for like hours. Just, you, just use Java 8. It will make your life so much better and it will make it so much easier. Um, if you really want to use Java 17 or whatever the hell they're on now, like you, you can, there's resources, there's guides, but that's just a lot of extra work for features that I'm sure most of us wouldn't be using anyway. Um, so yeah, just use Java 8, it'll be less headaches. Um, we'll hear more about assignment eight in particular next week, but that's an overview of everything we have left for this semester. That's literally everything, um, and, and then we're out of here. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say, I mentioned our final. Uh, I want to uh, make explicit, uh, our final is going to be on the last day of classes. All right, so our final is going to be that last Monday, that last Monday of April, and um, that's going to be our final exam. So the week prior, we're going to have an exam review session instead of a lecture, and then the last day of our class, we're going to have our final exam. Um, so we're going to have our final done, taken, and finished before finals week actually starts. Um, so that's kind of our arc, that's our trajectory, that's our path, and um, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. So. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I think that's everything I have intro-wise. That's everything um, that uh, we need. And um, 
yeah, I think that's uh, that. I think that's kind of it. If you have any questions about any of this, my DMs are open. Happy to kind of uh, help y'all out. Um, but yeah. All right. Whew. That's. Uh, I can stand up. I'm. I'm awake. I promise. Um, but yeah, that's going to be uh, our intro. That's what the rest of the semester is looking like. So what are we doing for the rest of the lecture? So basically, we're going to have two more lectures on unit stuff. We're going to have two Python or two Java lectures. Now, I know you all know Java. So we're going to take today to talk about lambdas in Java, which is an interesting little foray into the functional overlap. And next Monday, we're going to talk about multi-threading in Java. We're going to talk about threads and threading and multi-threading. And then the remainder of the semester is just going to be review and uh, maybe a lecture or two, me riffing about programming history. Um, <coughs> yeah, just going to be a bit of a, it's April. I get to talk about history now. That's, that's how it works. Sorry. <laughs> that's what you got uh, enrolling in my class. So but that's not yet. Now it's time for Lambda in Java. So let's just jump right in. This is kind of a whole narrative story arc. So we're going to just kind of start from the beginning. <clears throat> so basically, as a quick overview, right, as we kind of have figured out, uh, functional languages ha were never were quite that popular, right? We never seen them really until we've done Common Lisp. And it was so different and unintuitive that it was not uh, great to just kind of jump into it. So. A big reason for why functional languages never caught on was they were primarily inefficient, all right? A lot of them were interpreted rather than compiled, necessitated a garbage collector before that was really sustainable. And so in general, when programming was really taking root as an industry in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, nobody wanted to touch functional anything. It just was not seen as a viable or a beneficial uh, choice. Whereas today, they have a lot of benefits. The primary one that I've ranted about already is that they're very well suited for parallel execution. Um, and <coughs> <coughs> sorry, pollen nightmares. Um, but basically, you know, Functional languages, by definition, can be parallelized very uh, relatively easily, and that allows them to have a much big, uh, a big efficiency boost on hardware that has multiple CPU cores, which is all of it in 2024. Um, so, <clears throat> as a result, right, there has been an uptick in interest in functional languages and in functional principles. But despite this. Functional languages have not become mainstream for a variety of reasons. The biggest one, as I think the most intuitive, it's really different. Pretty much everybody in the modern era learns object-oriented <coughs> programming first. We start with Python or with Java, and then we kind of build up from there. And making the pivot to functional is such a left turn that nobody really wants to do it. All right? And while in this room, I can bully everybody into doing a common Lisp assignment in industry, there would be a revolt, and people would just be like, I'm going to go work somewhere else. Bye. And they would, all right? Unless you've converted them into your little common Lisp cult, uh, like they do at Naughty Dog or whatever, right? It's going to be a pretty hard sell to pivot your team from Java to you know, common Lisp or some other functional language. Also, functional languages weren't really designed with object-oriented programming in mind. Object-oriented programming pretty fundamentally opposes functional language, right? Object-oriented programming is about having an object with a state that changes over time. And functional languages don't have side effects. So they're pretty incompatible, all right? So <clears throat> what do? Functional has a lot of benefits. It has a lot of upside, but the cost is too high for the vast majority of developers to actually want to engage with. So what we see in language development around the 2000s and the 2010s is um, traditional imperative languages um, start stealing stuff. They pretty much go through functional languages and they ask themselves, OK, we don't want a purely functional language. Nobody wants to buy into that. But what are the biggest upsides of functional? And can we steal them and just chuck them into our language? All right. 
So functional methods such as recursion, functional abstraction, higher order functions, <coughs> things that have been traditionally rooted in functional languages, we start to see imperative languages start to steal some of those things. And so in Java, um, Java 8, which is like old now, I think Java 8 came out in like 2014, which is 10, fuck. Anyway, it's like 10 years old. And so we're gonna kind of see how Java 8 and subsequent versions of Java um, stole and implemented functional programming techniques. So some of the concepts that Java has kind of taken on are lambdas, streams, and collectors, all right? We've seen lambdas, those are our anonymous functions. Streams and collectors we haven't really gone quite as much into, but you can think of the map function as being kind of sort of in the same ballpark of what these things are, right? A lambda is an anonymous function that can provide some action, and a stream or a collection is a way to uh, implement that function on a collection of information. So, lambdas are introduced in Java, Java 8, back in March of 2014, almost a decade ago. Why were they added? Well, <clears throat> so I could just say because we wanted functional concepts, but that's uh, kind of oversimplifying it, all right? While this is a functional concept that has kind of been ripped out of the functional world and dropped into Java, there were legitimate Java reasons for adding it in. Java 8 was still before Oracle decided that Java was to be a hodgepodge of new ideas and still kind of thought of it as a stable language most people were using. So they didn't want to just haphazardly chuck in features back in the day. They actually wanted them to be solving known problems. And so what is the known problem that lambdas are a response to? All right, that's the question we want to ask here because again, programming languages are a human construct, they're a human development, and their growth is a level of organic, right? Features are added in response to developer complaints or frustrations. So in Java, if you wanted to define custom functions, right, so there's no lambda before Java 8, and so if you wanted to define a custom function, there's no way to do that. The only way in Java to do that is to create a custom class and that have that custom class implement a custom function. So there's no function as data, rather you just have to make a whole class and implement a function in said class. Okay. In particular, if you wanted to create a custom object with a custom function, you needed a custom object implementation. And now Java has no way to pass a function or function definition to an object and to have the object execute the given function. Right? There's no way to treat functions as data in Java. So basically the only solution here is to just make a new object and then have that object implement its own function and then pass that object around rather than passing around the function itself. And that was like good enough most of the time. But there was one specific area where this really was a pain in the ass. And that was classes that occurred only one time in a single application. Huh. <clears throat> so for example, the J button class defines a method called add action listener. Okay? Um, do, 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 do. There's a little code in a few slides, but basically J button, some Java swing thing. It's like Java FX, but worse and older. And we don't need to know the details, but the point being J button is a button object that is ideally supposed to be rendered on the screen and clicked. And the add action listener method takes a single argument of type action listener. Action listener is a Java interface with a single method called action perform. The idea is that whenever J button is pressed, when you press the physical button like in the GUI, the action perform method is called on all attached action listener objects. So here's the paradigm. Because there are no functions as data in Java, if you have a button and you wanna give that button a specific set of behaviors, you need to create a custom object of type action listener. I mean, technically, it's an interface, so you need to create a custom object called anything you want, which implements action listener, but I'm splitting Java hairs here. And then you create that custom object which implements action listener, and then you pass that object to your J button. So when the button is pressed, 
it finds all attached objects which implement action listener and then invoke each one of those objects uh, action performed methods. So rather than just giving your button object a custom method, you give your button object a custom object which implements an interface which has a specific method which is then implemented. So it's the same pr uh, end state of you're getting a custom method to your button, but there's this whole long convoluted chain of creating a custom object to nest that function inside of, rather than just being able to take the function as data and pass it over to your button, all right? And so in a project with multiple J buttons, each button will have a different action. So each J button has an action listener object with a uniquely defined action performed method. So basically, if you need a custom method for each button, that means each button needs a custom object which implements the uh, action listener interface. Okay. So does this mean that every time we create a new button, we also need to create a new class file defining an object which implements action listener and overrides the action perform method? That would be unmanageable. It's not unreasonable to think of a GUI application with a few dozen buttons. They add up quick all of a sudden. When all of the features of your application need to be accessible via a graphical user interface, you slowly start to realize just how many different little settings and sliders and little elements are part of your application that a user might need to tweak, modify, engage with. Buttons add up. So the idea that you have two or three dozen buttons is a very reasonable thing, even if the application is not very large. And so if you have two or three dozen buttons, that's two or three dozen specially defined object listener, uh, action listener, it's a mess. It's a mess. Do you really want two or three dozen dot .java files all in like what, like a specific package, each one named J button class one, J but like, ah, hate that for me. Truly do. <clears throat> so, that is a bit of a problem, right? And so Java, before anything changed, Java recognized this as a problem. And the original canonical solution to this was an anonymous inner class. So in Java, an anonymous inner class is a class without a name and for which only a single object is created. And this can be used to implement interfaces as well as overriding other objects. And this is our syntax. So I want to kind of sit and marinate in this for a second and give us some context here. Because again, this is doing a lot of Java things. And so I want to make sure that we all are kind of kicking off the rust on the Java side of it. So basically, here we have a new J button object, which is just calling a J button constructor. And we can just imagine that works fine. And then what we do here is we invoke a method we call test button dot add action listener. So the add action listener method takes in a single object of type action listener. Okay? So instead of calling a constructor and constructing some object which implements the action listener interface, what we do instead is we do new action listener and then an opening bracket after the parentheses. So it syntactically looks as if we're calling the constructor for action listener, but action listener is not an object, it is an interface. Thus, it does not have constructors defined. It cannot be implemented. And so we use this open curly brace and this closing curly brace to indicate that we are not in fact creating an action listener object per se, but rather we're creating a new custom object which implements action, uh, action listener. Oh. And so that's what these four lines of code in the middle are. Inside of our curly brace, we can implement functions for this one-off anonymous class. So we're creating a new object which implements action listener, which means we are required to override the method in the action listener interface, which in this case is called action performed, which takes in an action event, which is just how Java handles you know, clicks and stuff, not super important. The main part that I care about is that we're overriding the interface's method, action performed, giving it custom behavior, and then we have a closing bracket, a parenthesis, and a semicolon. Because again, 
that parenthesis, second to last character, closes off the opening parenthesis of the ad action listener method. So what we're basically saying is we're calling ad action listener, creating a new object of type action listener, but that's not something you're allowed to do because action listener is an interface on an object and interfaces don't have constructors. So by putting these curly braces, that tells the Java compiler, hey, we're creating an anonymous one-off object which implements action listener. And that will compile as long as you override the uh, action listener method that the interface requires you override. Now, I could also add other methods in this anonymous class, but there's no point to do so. <coughs> okay? Yeah? So action performs an already, is an already existing method within like action listener? Like yeah, well, action listener is an interface, yeah. so it provides the action performed stub, but it does not provide an implementation. So overriding the action performed method provided in the action listener interface is a requirement of any object which implements said interface. Okay? Um, yeah? Does that mean that you could just kind of like just override any method within there as long as it gets like your job done? Yes. So Basically, when you're creating a custom object using an anonymous inner class, you can override any method, you can implement any method you want. For this specific case of the action listener interface, the action perform method is the single method that the interface requires you override. So that's why we're overriding this in this case. But you do have the flexibility to implement whatever uh, uh, functions you want. And if you're uh, using a different interface to uh, implement, you know, if it has multiple functions, you can, you know, you basically you have to override all the methods that the interface requires you to override. And then you can add extra ones on top. If this is an anonymous uh, inner class, which subclass is something else, then you can pick and choose what superclass methods to override. Basically, this is just an object. So you have the same flexibility you have in any other Java object. It's just we're not naming it. It's a one-off object that we create a uh, definition for, instantiate it, and then we can never create it again. All right? That's kind of the point. So anything you can do with a normal Java object, you can you know, do in here. Because most of the time, we don't want to. Okay? But you do have the flexibility if the need arises. <laughs> so. So this is our solution. And it's actually funny because my undergrad career, actually, I started off using this. So I've actually coded with this. I had to do, uh, what was it? Space Invaders in like 2013, 2012. And so time does keep marching on. I had to do uh, something like this a little more than a decade ago. All right? And I will tell you from experience, <clears throat> Sure, anonymous inner classes do prevent the smattering of class files. Uh, you know, you don't have 30, 40, 50 extra Java files lying around, but these are still verbose as all hell. You're implementing an anonymous object, and the syntax is so weird. Closing bracket, closing parenthesis, semicolon. I'm sorry, but this is cursed. This shouldn't happen. Like, it works. The compiler can figure it out, but something about that just screams, we patch this together. This is butchery, all right? <clears throat> so anonymous inner classes are our traditional solution here, but they are not beloved by any stretch. And Java, being a language that wants to still kind of be king language, still wants to be on top of the pile, wants to continue innovating, pushing forward. And this is 2014. So they haven't just lost to Python and kind of started flailing quite yet. So as an alternative to anonymous inner classes, Java 8 introduces lambda expressions. Lambda expressions address the bulkiness of anonymous inner classes by converting those five lines of code into a single statement. This horizontal solution solves the, quote, vertical problem presented by anonymous inner classes. Basically, it's syntactic sugar. The idea is, can we reduce this blocky, huge chunk of code Right? The vertical problem, right? You have more lines of code, it kind of expands downward. Can we make this into a one-liner, a straight shot? So <clears throat> let's look at a lambda. Let's look at how it works. 
And then let's talk about the trickery that they had to do to implement this. So a lambda expression is composed of three separate parts, an argument list, an arrow, and a token body. So the idea here is that you have your parentheses, and that lists all the inputs to your function. You have an arrow, which is just syntax. And then you have a, quote, token body, which is going to be the body of your method, all right? Body of your function. I'm going to use method and function semi-interchangeably here because, well, the distinction between the two gets pretty muddled because of what we're doing, all right? So the body can either be a single expression or a statement block, so you can have the body of your function be multi-line. This is not restricted to a single statement. So if this is your lambda, if this is telling you your input parameters, an arrow, and then the body of your method, this to me sounds a lot like functions as data. That's what this looks like. And it's supposed to look like that. This looks like we're just defining a function on the fly and then giving that function to uh, an object. So does Java have functions as data? Do lambda expressions create functions as data? No. No, they do not. Java can't do that. So what the hell is going on here? This looks like functions as data, but I'm saying that it's not functions as data. So what is it? It's not great. <laughs> so let's look at the nightmare that Oracle has created for ourselves. Lambda expressions are anonymous methods which are used to implement an anonymous object which implements a functional interface. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll say it again. It is an annoyingly long chain of events. Lambda expressions are anonymous methods which are used to implement anonymous objects which implement a functional interface. What is a functional interface? In Java, a functional interface is any interface with a single abstract method. So if a method is abstract, it is required to be overridden by anything that implements the interface or extends the subclass. In this case, they're all going to be interfaces, so I'll just stick to talking about interfaces. And so if you have an interface with an anonymous method, excuse me, with an abstract method, then when you implement the interface, the abstract method is required to be overridden and implemented. The point of an abstract method is you define a method header, but do not provide a body or implementation. Basically saying anything that implements that interface has to have this method, but we have no idea how you will need to define it, so we make it abstract so that you're forced to implement it, but you are also, you're forced to implement it. So it's, you know that the method will be there, but you also know whoever made the object and is implementing the interface provided a custom behavior for the implemented method and didn't just rely on a predefined version that doesn't make any sense, okay? So in Java, a functional interface is any interface with a single abstract method. And so using functional interfaces with anonymous inner classes was a common design pattern in Java. So with this pattern, we can substitute anonymous inner classes with lambda expressions. And this provides lambda expressions with a very large potential for use. Okay, whatever. Not important. So here is two examples. Two examples of this. Um, and then I think I'm going to just take a quick pause and we're just going to dig through the API. <clears throat> but so here's an example of this. So we have two invocations of the same thing, one using an anonymous inner class, one using a lambda. So the top ones are anonymous inner class, okay? We're creating a new runnable object. So we're creating a new object which implements the runnable interface, which is in Java, it's used for threading and stuff. So we create a new runnable object, and because runnable is an interface, we need to create a custom object which implements the runnable interface. And so to do that, we create an anonymous inner class, right? New runnable, and then an opening bracket and a closing bracket to indicate that this is a custom object which implements runnable. And then the, uh, we override the runnable method, all right? The, uh, the un the abstract method provided by the runnable interface is the run method. And because run is abstract, 
it is required to be overridden, and so that's what we do. And all it does is print out hello world one. Okay. Now, down here, rentable R2 does functionally the same exact thing, just using a lambda. And so here, we have our inputs, which are nothing. There are no parameters for the run method. We have an arrow, and then we have our single statement. These two things do the exact same thing. They both create an anonymous object which implements a public interface and overrides any abstract method that interface has. And then we can call run on both R1 and R2 because they both contain runnable objects. All right. Whew. So how does Lambda get away with doing this? <clears throat> and basically what I want to stress here, um, let's just look at it. Let's look at the course source. Basically what I want to stress here is that Lambda isn't doing anything that the anonymous inner class isn't. All right? It's doing the same stuff. But let's look at how it's able to piece that together. So if I go to the Java API, let's not sit on the clicker. So if I go to the Java API, um, oh yeah. so here we have our runnable interface, OK? So our runnable interface is actually listed as a functional interface, OK? It's listed as a functional interface because the runnable <coughs> interface has a single abstract method. You can confirm that. And it's called run, all right? So we know that when we are using a lambda, right? that we have to be implementing this single method. So if I look over at this code right here, right, what Java is doing is actually just piecing together through inference a lot of the information that we're providing explicitly in the anonymous inner class. We know that R2 is going to be of type runnable. And we know runnable is an interface. So we know that we are allowed to put any object that implements the runnable interface into R2. And so by defining the input tokens, we are matching the input parameters of run. And here's the trick here. We know that the anonymous object has to implement the runnable interface. And we know that runnable is a functional interface, meaning there is only a single abstract method to be overridden. So the lambda can just assume and assert that the only thing that this could be implementing is the run method in the runnable interface. It is inferring the type of object that needs to be created and the method that that object needs to override. So it basically is overloading. Yeah. Where yeah. runnable is the name of the method, and then the parentheses are the things that are the uh, constructors that it takes up off of? So not quite. The, the parentheses here are just the inputs to the function. It's just your yeah, parameters. Yeah. That's yeah. What I meant. It, like, if that was like uh, int x yeah. int y, if they had two abstract methods, one that said int x. Well, so that's the two. trick. It can't have more than one abstract method, or else this can't infer which abstract method it is. A functional interface, by definition, has one abstract method. So that's a whole level of complication we don't even need to worry about because of how this is defined, all right? Um, because the, the kind of the premise here is that Java, just from knowing that this has to be a runnable object, and because runnable is a functional interface, that means the only method that a lambda can be overriding is the run method of the runnable interface. There's no other method it could be implementing here. And that's kind of the whole trick with lambdas. It allows you to type less syntax because it infers all of the information you're no longer providing explicitly. That's kind of the trick here, right? 
And this is something that a lot of programming languages do in one form or another, but I like this because it's very explicit, because most languages have always inferred that data, and you, you know, whereas this, it used to not, and then an update happened, and now it's capable of inferring a whole slew of information that previously it was incapable of inferring. And that growth is something that you don't often have a crystal clear through line example to show. Um, but so that's what's going on here. Runnable knows, or excuse me, this lambda knows what it is implementing because of inference and because of the strong typing system of Java, right? Java knows that R2 is a variable of type runnable and it can guarantee, because Java has a strong typing system, that the only object allowed in there is an object which implements runnable. And so if we have a lambda, that lambda has to implement runnable and runnable has one abstract method because it's a functional interface, so the lambda has to implement that interface, uh, that abstract method. And so that's kind of the trick here. Everything about this huge chunk can be inferred, all right? All of this information can be inferred, and instead of defining you know, explicitly the method and that it's being overridden, we can simply just drop in a lambda, and that will work for us, okay? Whew. So, questions about this? Cool. This is, I'm torn between calling it impressive and jank as hell, because it's kind of both. It's designed under constraint at its finest, right? You can't actually give functions as data, so how about you do the next best thing and just give a syntax that looks like functions as data and infers all of the ugly object creation that needs to happen for you know, Java to actually work. Because the other thing I'll say about Java, okay, I don't drop frames. The other thing I'll say about Java is that, again, for as much slack as it, you know, as, as, as much as you know, we, we, we bully it in 2024 for being a little old hat, for a long time, Java was the gold standard. And if you are the language that is a gold standard, the idea that you want to go into your internals and mess them all up and take all the legacy code people have been writing for 20 years and make it not work anymore, that is a textbook way to get people to abandon ship on your language and say, I hate these guys. There's a reason why languages are very, very cautious about making breaking changes. When Python moved from Python 2 to Python 3, which were incompatible with each other, they basically said, yo, Python 2 will stay alive for like a decade. We're so sorry about this. Please, we promise we're not going to do this again. There's just, we really needed to do this. And they kind of had to beg developers not to go abandon shit. I mean, it clearly it worked, but there is a massive, large scale, coordinated effort. One might even call it a political effort to convince developers it was worth the pain of transition in order to get to the other side. I'm back with hung on that one. And um, <clears throat> that was something they had to fight and convince people of, all right? And they were ultimately successful, but that was a big battle. You don't see it happen very often. Because a lot of times when languages try and pull shit like that, everyone leaves. Everyone's like, I don't need this. I want to write code in a language that I don't think, that I, you know, that I don't have to throw away in three years, right? Um, the only other uh, languages that I can think of that did this are Apple-related languages because Apple is being sued by the federal government for having such a monopolistic walled garden. So yeah, when you're Apple and you've created an illegal monopoly, you can throw your weight around. You can say, hey, yeah, we're breaking Swift 2 and you're moving to Swift 3 and if you don't like it, fuck you. Apple can get away with, well, Okay, Apple has historically been able to get away with that. We'll see if the feds have a disagreement on that front. But most other language developers do not have the you know, weight of a trillion dollar corporation to bully everyone into changing things. So outside of that, or a massive campaign of, oh my god, please, please, I promise, you really don't want to just start breaking your language, right? <clears throat> From the perspective of Java, if you're going to start making language changes that will break previous versions, people are going to hate you, and it's going to be real hard to recover. And Oracle paid a pretty penny for some microsystems back in the day. I really don't think they want to burn that investment to the ground. But what do I know? I'm not a business student. 
So that's our overall concept of lambdas and why that they're created in this way. I really do think it's not a common lens in computer science, but I do think it is important to kind of not forget that languages are human-made constructs and that some of the design decisions are more political and cultural like choices and forces necessarily than just purely technical ones, okay? So <clears throat> let's show some of the other things we can do. Oh, I was one shot too early. Whatever. Um, basically, what else can we build with functional languages? So here we have a list, which is like an array list, but it's slightly more generic. Don't worry about it. We have a list of strings. We, um, it's actually the variables of type list, but the object we're creating is an array list. So you know, again, don't worry about the typing as much. Just think of them all as array lists. And so we have uh, an array list of strings. We add a few strings to that array list. We have a traditional iterator, right? Which we see is just a for each loop, right? And we can use a for each loop on our array list and go over and iterate over every element. Now we could also make a lambda expression to do this as well. There is the for each method in the list object and that for each method takes in some type of object, which can be a lambda, and we provide a custom behavior. So basically, we are giving a custom iterator here. Now, in this case, we're going over every element, taking in that element, and then doing something with it. Okay. So there's flexibility here, right? Um, now, there are shortened lambda expressions, but I'm by and large going to ignore those because I don't want to get into them. Basically, the shortened lambda expressions just are special cases when the compiler can infor infer more information than a traditional lambda. But again, I think that's two in the weeds. So, yeah. In a case where a method already exists to perform an operation on the class, this syntax can be used instead of the normal lambda expression. Cool, I don't care. So, um, sure, okay. We can use these to create threads, all right? Basically, what I'm trying to show here is that the paradigm of the functional interface where you have an object as your parameter, that object implements an interface, that interface is a functional interface, i.e. it has one abstract method, it's a very common paradigm in Java. And that's not an accident, right? <clears throat> so the idea is anytime you have something like, say, runnable, runnable is an interface, and it's a functional interface. It has a single abstract method. If that's the circumstance you're in, you can use a lambda to create an anonymous object which implements that interface and implements the abstract method that that interface provides. So here, runnable, we can use a lambda to create a object which implements runnable and that overrides the run method so that we can use the runnable object to make a thread and start that thread and you know it will call the run method and that's how the thread will behave. Now, we don't need this to be a single expression. We can make these relatively complex, right? Um, here, I'm creating a new thread, and the thread constructor takes in a runnable object, and so we use a lambda expression instead, because an object which implements runnable, runnable is a functional interface, functional interface has a single abstract method, so thus we can infer that if we provide a lambda to the thread constructor, it's implementing an anonymous object which implements the runnable interface, which has a single abstract method. Thus, that is, the abstract method is what the lambda is overriding. Again, you can follow it along, but it's messy as all hell, right? We are really throwing a lot of work at the compiler. We are, it is a fascinating little trade-off here, right? The language by definition, the only way to do this is this clunky multi-step layer of you know, creating an anonymous object which implements an interface, which overrides a method, and that hasn't gone away. We're just hiding it from the programmer. We're just saying, don't worry about it, sweetie. Just use a lambda. 
all of the same clunky stuff from anonymous inner classes is still present in the language. It's just we're inferring all that information now rather than explicitly stating it. It's still all there. We didn't make any of it go away. We were just hiding it, sweeping it under the rug, you might say. <coughs> um, and the nice thing here, too, is this is a more complex method implementation, right? It has a try-catch block, um, which it needs to invoke the sleep method on thread. Um, and then we can just start it right here, right? New thread, and then all of this is inside of the constructor. So we're creating an anonymous object which implements the functional interface's single method, passing that object to the thread constructor, and then once that constructor has finished, we invoke start. So we're basically creating a new thread, defining how that thread behaves, and starting that thread all in one go. Again, it really is just syntactic sugar. It really is just making our syntax better, but that's to our extreme advantage. So um, that's lambdas. That's everything that a lambda does. Okay? It is, again, and I will just say it, I, I, I am pretty confident that that framework of what does a lambda actually do, that will show up on a final, all right? That, 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 that long convoluted, long-winded of a lambda, you know, implements an object which, I will, I will rephrase that at a later date. But that chain of events, that is an expected piece of knowledge. So to continue forward, right, a stream, so let's continue with our functional concept. So if we have a lambda, if we have something that sort of kind of maybe-ish looks, if we squint hard enough, looks like functions as data, then we can start to implement things that traditionally use functions as data, in this case, a stream. The stream is a key abstraction used in lambda expressions. A stream is not a data structure. Instead, it conveys elements from a source, such as a data structure, through a pipeline of computational operations. Streams are functional in nature. An operation on a stream produces a result, but does not modify its source. Filtering does not modify the original source, but creates a new stream without filtered elements. Many stream operations, such as filtering, mapping, or duplicate removal, are implemented lazily, allowing for optimization. OK, what the hell is all of that? What is that word, salad, vomit? Basically, a stream is like not a data structure, but it kind of is. A data structure, and like I, I want to split the difference of what this distinction is. A data structure is by definition meant to something that is storing data in a specific structure that can be accessed, modified, and manipulated. That's the point of a data structure, right? It allows us to store and retrieve our data in particular ways. Now, a stream is not a data structure because you can't, there's no ordering or particular way of storage, and you cannot remove and, and modify streams in that way. Rather, streams convey elements from a source through a pipeline of computational operations, which is just really clunky Java speak for saying these don't act like data structures. These are just a fun little container for elements of a data structure that can be used to apply operations on. There's not really a great way to say that because it's a kind of a clunky Java thing. Yeah? Isn't that just a function? Hmm? Is it not always guaranteed? Um, so here's the thing, a stream is the collection of data which we then can apply functions on that stream of data. That's the idea, yeah. And we'll show a few of these right now, um, which is basically to say, again, I'm ignoring the shortened lambda expression, I don't care about it really, but if we have a list with several elements inside of it and I want to apply a map operation to that list, I can't apply the map operation to the list itself the list does not support a functional construct like map. Rather, I can create a stream object and then invoke map on the stream. Okay? Why is there a distinction? Java reasons. Okay? Why not just invoke map directly on the data structure? Because that's going to involve making the data structure 
robust on an internal level in a way that it was never designed to be. So the stream is this kind of cheat. Take all the data elements, chuck them into this stream construct, and then we can manipulate the data in the stream without worrying about if that affects the underlying data structure. So in this case, we're calling a map operation, which takes in a lambda, and this lambda will take in a string s and return the uppercase version of that string. And then we are invoking for each on the resulting stream. So basically, you have a stream, you invoke map on that stream, map will then return a new stream with the modified elements, and then with the new stream, you can either use like a for each method to print or go over each new element, or there is a collect method that allows you to convert a stream into a new data structure. Um, all right. Does this mean lambda expressions can create functions as data? I mean, the answer is no, but let's look at the API. Yeah? What does calling stream on some list do to some list? So that's a great question. What does calling stream on some list do to some list? Literally nothing. Like by definition, it does nothing. Stream will basically take a copy of all of some list elements and store it in its stream, which is just a just think of it's, it's, it's not a data structure in the sense because we don't know how the data is being stored and we're not allowed to manipulate it directly as a normal data structure. Think of stream <coughs> as just a bucket. It's a bucket of all our elements. We don't know how that bucket's arranged. We don't understand the internals. All we know is we can invoke functional concepts on that bucket. Okay? But it, by definition, does not touch some list. Okay? Yeah? Can you move? Yeah. Yeah, that's the point. You can take the stream and then apply any functional operation on that stream that you want. And you can stack them as well. I can call a map and then a filter and then a collect one, two, three, all on the stream. That's kind of what it's meant to be. A stream is meant to just be a special way to uh, coalesce data together and then apply functional concepts on that data. That's the entire point of the stream. Um, and so if we look up at the API, if I take a quick second and I want to go look at map, <clears throat> um, did not need to do that in all caps. OK, so map is an interface. Um, let's see, we invoke map with a constructor. So what about its abstract methods? Which one did I say this was? Oh, it's an interface. Did I? Is there no constructor? Great. I love. I love when a demo comes together. <laughs> yeah, man. I know. Really? Oh, no, that's right. Oh, oh, that's why. I'm, I'm done. It's supposed to be that. There we go. OK. She was looking at the wrong thing. That was my bad. So basically, map isn't an object. Map's a function. Doi. So basically, we create a stream object. And on that stream object, we invoke its map function. What does the map function take in? The map function takes in the function object. 
So in Java, there is an interface called function, and it is a functional interface whose single abstract method is called apply, and it's a generic type too. So basically, is it functions as data? No. There is a functional interface called function, which implements a generic apply method with a generic type T, meaning it can take in a single parameter of any specified type and then apply an arbitrary action. So are there functions as data in Java? No, there is a functional interface called function, which is implemented by an object and the apply method from the function interface is then implemented. So this is Java's workaround for not having functions as data. They create a function interface, which you then implement in an anonymous object, which overrides the apply method so that you can have code that looks like you're passing a function to a map. It looks like functions as data. It looks really close to functions as data. And people think, oh, they did it in Java. No, they just took away all the syntax so you don't quite realize you're just creating objects and passing objects to objects and objects to objects. Java is a messy little object-based language and functions aren't objects in Java, so this is their workaround. Create a bunch of anonymous objects which implement functions and then just lie to you or hide the fact, nice catch, that you're creating objects, not just functions, right? It's a mess. It does work and it is pretty clever, but oh man, it's like, it's like oh, this is a really nice, sleek, simple car, and then you pop the hood and it's just like fear. To be fair, it's, the car is not the proper analogy. I know it doesn't really track, but a pinball machine is very much like this. Pinball machines look smooth, they look sleek, they look cool. You ever have the misfortune of having to pop one of those and look on the underneath? It is a rat's nest of wires, I promise you. A true, I don't know how to say that guy's name, <clears throat> but it's a nightmare, truly. Um, <coughs> yeah. Just like fundamentally, the language, the, like the EBNF, the grammar, like at its very core, Java just never treats functions as data. It's not built into the language design, and it's just, just, just that's why. It's just not designed to. So what are they treated as? Uh, functions are constructs that are intrinsically built into objects or, you know, class files. A static method is either, it's defined in a class. So from the perspective of Java syntax, a method slash function has to be part of a class file. It can't just be um, created separately and packaged up as data. You can't bind a function to a variable or anything like that. And those are decisions made at the language design level, <coughs> all right? Which is why you can't get around them. Um, because if they're made at the language design level, the only way to fix it is to redesign the basic language. And that's gonna break previous versions of Java and that's a no-go because that's political, like a poison pill, right? All your developers would leave you. Um, so, just for the quick YouTube chat, that is a technology connections reference, uh, except for the fact that the pinball video that the, he, the series that technology connections is doing uh, happens to just be up my alley. I actually own a pinball machine and I fixed it myself. Um, yeah, I know, I know, on brand. Um, <clears throat> but no, I had a pinball machine, it was pretty beat up, uh, and I got my hands on it, and I had to disassemble the entire thing. I had to fix a few parts. Uh, very fun to turn on a piece of electronics that hasn't been turned on in 25 years and you just hear the pop of the capacitor going kaboom and then you finally buy a new capacitor, desolder the blown out one, put the new one in, somehow do not ruin the board and then turn the power back on to have another capacitor go pop. Real fun stuff, truly and honestly. Um, but I do love technology connections. Uh, hi Keith, I've been watching him for a few years, really good stuff. Anyway, Ram does. Um, really, that's kind of the main point, right? The idea that how do we implement a map? Well, we have the function interface. That's Java's dirty little secret. That's how they do the ugly stuff, right? They have a functional interface called function that you create an anonymous object which implements the function interface and that function interface has a single anonymous method, which is what the, you know, the lambda here is implementing. Um, yeah, 
So just to kind of, without, without diving back into the house of cards that is how Java does this, just to give some concepts of what can be done now that we have these tools, we can create a stream and apply a filter to it. Um, that filter can be relatively trivial, like a one-liner, where we just, you know, filter out all elements whose length is greater than three, or we can make more complicated filters where we make everything uppercase and we check substrings, like whatever. We can make a complicated function here. Um, so <clears throat> the filter method takes a single predicate object. Predicate is a functional interface, and a predicate will always return a Boolean value. The filter will return a stream object with all elements, which return true for the given predicate. So basically, you have a stream of elements, apply a filter with a custom-defined function, and then it will apply that function on every element in the stream, and all elements for whom the predicate returns true are included in the new resulting stream, and all ones for which it's false are excluded from the new stream. Although predicate is a functional interface in Java, the concept of a predicate is pretty widely um, used. I used predicates in my master's thesis in Objective-C slash Swift. That was a long time ago now. Um, the other thing about uh, uh, streams is that we're able to apply multiple operations to them. So here we have a list where we get a stream from that list, then we have a map operation, and then we have a reduce operation. Okay? Reduce here is going to take the collection of elements and reduce them down to a single value. In this case, an integer. So basically we have a stream of string elements. We then have a map operation which converts every string into its integer length. And then we have a reduce operation that is going to take in the current and previous elements, sum them, and accumulate that value. And so we're basically in the sum of all string lengths for the given input, and then store the result in an integer. Okay. Again, this is a contrived example, but if you have to do something like this, it's really nice that we have lambdas and streams because the way to do this without those in Java is probably a 50 to 75 line solution. Okay. The other thing I'll note that streams Another advantage of streams vis-a-vis -vis data structures is that streams are a lot less sticklery about typing, right? If I have a, an array list of strings, I can't apply a map operation to convert those to integers. Java's gonna get really mad. But creating one stream of strings and then that being transformed into a new stream of integers is allowed because one is a diff, like they're two separate streams. So that's the idea about streams in Java. There are little template collectors, and each time you apply an operation on a stream, it just creates a new stream rather than modifying the one you were given. Okay? It's a very kind of quirky in the weeds thing, but it's done so that, again, Java can keep its super strong typing system while still giving you flexibility. That's why we have a stream instead of modifying the data structures directly. The data structures have expectations and standards and a strong typing system to contend with. The streams are a lot more flexible. You can take a stream, apply a map, get different outputs data type wise, right? Like a stream of strings comes in, a stream of ints goes out, and tide goes in, tide goes out, can't explain that. And it's pretty easy uh, to, to do and get away with. <clears throat> um, If you're curious, that's the wall of text that explains reduce. I think the general principle is good enough for now. I'm not going to hammer the point. Um, yep, we can reduce a list. That's really cool. There's sometimes there are custom functions. There's a map to int function specifically designed for efficiency purposes, the conversions to integers, but again, I don't care. I don't really want, it's not particularly important to me. I'm more interested in the structural, how Java gets away with it, and how that applies to the larger concept of programming languages than I am the specific intricacies of how to do it in Java. Um, yep, here this reduce operation, rather than taking an integers, takes in a stream of strings and reduces this collection of strings into a single concatenated big old ugly string. Cool. 
One of the cool elements that you get out of collections uh, out of lambdas here is that we can actually use lambdas to define custom comparators. So if I use collections.sort, collections.sort is Java's predefined sort operation for lists. It's powerful. I'm assuming it's n log, big O of n log n, which is better than any of the sorting algorithms I can write by hand. So I tend to use collections.sort when I need to sort an array in Java. But the way collections.sort works is collections.sort takes in a list of elements which implement the comparable interface. And the comparable interface has to be implemented by the underlying objects in the array list. And the uh, comparable interface, right, the way you implement that interface is going to be consistent for all versions of that object, right? What we refer to as the object's natural ordering. Sometimes, though, there are times where you want to sort a collection of some elements in a way that is different than the natural ordering. For example, a collection of strings that you want in reverse alphabetical order, right? Um, so, or, or more complicated than what's up here, but sometimes you might want to have a sort, uh, sort collections of strings in a way that you would expect for titles, i.e., a and the are ignored in the alphabetical sort, which is a kind of a bit of a pain in the ass to implement, right? And you wouldn't want to do that in your generic sorting of all strings. But with lambdas, we can apply a custom comparator function for the individual sort we're doing. So here I'm passing collections a list and a lambda defining how to compare two objects of the given list. In this case, the list is of strings, so we say how to combine, to, how to compare two strings, which is just using compare two. It's a quick one-liner. It's kind of cheap. It doesn't really do anything. But I could implement literally anything I want in here. So if I wanted a complex comparator that allows you to compare you know, strings to each other but ignore leading A's, ands, and thes, so that you don't have your artist list have the Beatles and the White Stripes and the strokes all right next to each other, right? You assume the Beatles are in B and the strokes are in S, right? You don't need them all to be in T. You might give yourself a custom comparator to do that rather than trying to change how strings are sorted in Java. That seems like a bigger ask. Um, yep. All I'll say about collectors is basically these functional operations just provide streams on streams on streams, right? You take in a stream, you apply the operation, the result is another stream. Streams are not data structures. So the collect function allows you to take a stream and collect the elements in that stream and put them into an actual proper data structure. So here, right, we create a new list of strings called collect. We take some list, make a stream, apply a map operation to it, and then the stream that results from that map, we apply a collect operation to, and that collect will then convert the final stream into a list object, which will then be stored in our collect variable. Okay? Why is there a... Okay, no idea. Um, yep, you can collect into a generic list. You can collect into specific like, types of objects like array list. Okay? I don't really care about these examples other than to show you can do complex stuff with them. I ran out of time. Basically, uh, do I really care? I kind of do. Not to rant too much at the right tail end of the lecture, but basically the big benefit of streams is they're computed lazily and they have the ability to be executed in uh, parallel if necessary. Streams are able to be executed in parallel. And the reason why that's, uh, by default, streams are sequential because Java just can't help itself and take this really clever solution and shoot themselves in the foot with it. The entire point of having collections is, uh, of, of having, yeah, of having streams is that you can apply the operations on those streams in parallel, but by default, it's still done sequentially because Java's scared of parallel programming, I guess. Um, you can, 
use them in parallel though, and as a result, stream operations have to be, quote, non-interfering, i.e., a stream operation can't go back and modify the underlying data structure the stream was derived from. The reason for this is that you were never meant to multi-thread access to data structures in Java. ArrayList does not like it when multiple threads are trying to access it at the same time. It gets big mad and it tends to crash and lock up your program. The whole kind of concept of a stream is that they're designed so that they can be executed in parallel. You can apply operations in parallel to a stream <coughs> and that will be okay. So for most data sources, preventing interference means ensuring that the data source is not modified at all during the execution of the stream pipeline. This is because most data sources are not designed to handle concurrent modification, okay? So a behavioral parameter is to interfere with non-concurrent data if it modifies or causes to be modified the stream's data source. Basically, your stream operations cannot fuck with the underlying data source. And I just synthesized what these five slides were all trying to say. Thank you for sticking with this long unhinged rant about, function, uh, about Java stealing functional concepts in probably the best or worst way, depending on your take. I will see you all back in here on Monday. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Enjoy this gorgeous weather. Bye, everybody. See ya.